What is going down everybody? It is your boy Zary and before we get into the video I just want to remind everybody if you're under level 15 and you want $10 worth of free stuff go to your settings go to use promo code and type in XMG gifts. You do that you'll get $10 worth of free stuff it helps support the channel. So if you're under level 15 make sure you're using that promo code XMG gift. Enjoy the video. What is going down my YouTube family? Super pumped. This is the conclusion of worst to first we are doing the top 10 and if you're unsure how i rank these characters please go back watch the original one after this is said make sure you are liking the videos commenting on them sharing them with your guild mates letting me know what you think i did right and what i did wrong can't wait to finish this up so let's jump into it we are here with dr frank dr frank is easy number 10 for me i think he is the best goblin out there huge plug and play viability great for tower hard tower all that good stuff starting with his passive ability if a goblin ally attacks an enemy with shock another random goblin is called into assist right so he loses his passive ability under shock but if a goblin ally attacks an enemy with shock okay but he puts out that shock he does pair better with goblins obviously but losing that passive ability does not hinder him at all for me because of this right here restores 350 magic damage to shield of all allies restores health equal to all allies equivalent to 50 percent of the shield restored love this move and then it can just build and build and build absolutely love it you use it every time it is up then he has his iron and flat aoe 300 percent magic damage inflicts shock for two turns perfect you know, and he doesn't even have tier 7 abilities, and we'll kind of go back and talk about what I think of his tier 7s. But I love this. If the target is inflicted by shock, they are inflicted by days for two turns. And then he puts on shock for two more turns. Beautiful move kit. So what, what could we do to make this guy even better? Here, I'd like to see two random goblins called into assist, and then this gets bumped up to three. Okay restores 350 this goes up to 475 percent here inflicts shock for two turns i would like to see a caveat if they have shock calls into assist on the primary target right or something like that or or not only does it do shock maybe puts out some regeneration or dispels if the opponent already has shock something like that here we up the damage and i love this ability so we're just looking at up the damage but maybe put in um a debuff immunity or a potency increase something like that would be super beneficial but dr frank doesn't need a lot to make him great easy choice to be in the top 10 love him at number 10 number nine the original og soleus himself and soleus has to be here even without his lead he is so good in any sort of gameplay. Tower, early game, mid game, end game. Fantastic healer, no T7s again on this champion. When the battle starts, all allied human defenders, blah, blah, blah. Humans, 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 right? Okay, you lose that. I get it. Amos Blessing. Heals an ally by 40% of their max health. Applies an armor increase, tenacity increase, haste, damage increase, cheat death for two turns. Make this three, up the amount of health restored. Easy T7. Amos' blessing, really good. Heals allies by 550 of his magic damage. Make this 650, 700. Just make it something ungodly. Huge. Then on his basic, 210, 15% chance to restore um, one turn to a random ability. Make this like 30, 40% up the damage. You know what I'd love to see here too is, um, you know, you're up in the damage, you're restoring that ability, but then giving something to the team, maybe um, dispelling or has a 20% chance to give out armor increase or something like that just to increase the overall survivability or heal the lowest health ally, that would be awesome as well. But Soleus is just one of those guys who stands the test of time. You can find a place to put him. Even if you don't use him as a lead or pair him with Nightingale, you're using him somewhere in Battlegrounds. He's fantastic. 
Very good character. Rightfully deserve it of the top 10. Number 9 for me is Solius. I'm ready for it. I know. But number 8, Tubald. Tubald is just insane. The best dwarf does not require dwarves at all. Like I said with Zappy, dwarves benefit from having Tubald. For every 2% charge, he gets an accuracy increase. And penetration, increasing his damage. If his charge is less than 50%, gains 25% charge on a critical hit. That is insane. Feeding himself that charge. The rest is tool. Don't care about that. This move here, IT7'd it. Restores 20% regeneration or charge. Gets critical chance increase, damage increase for two turns. Then he gives charge to all other dwarves, but that doesn't matter. He's giving himself 20 and then increasing his damage, right? Here, 550 physical damage, inflicts days for two turns, consumes 30% charge. For every 10% charge, he prolongs the bleeding effect. If the target is not afflicted by bleeding, restores 20% charge to himself. Doesn't matter if they attack him or not, he'll rebuild his charge off any move. Except his basic, but 340 on a basic inflicts bleeding for every 5% charge consumed. Now, a lot of these abilities we just read are tier 7, but that only makes him better. At tier level 6, gear 11, no gear 11 pieces, I can crit for 50k. Gear 11 plus pieces, I'm critting for 60 to 80k. Gear, gear 12 with T7s, I've crit for over 100k. Doesn't need dwarves to do that. Just himself. You put him on a team with somebody who gives him a damage increase. Or can feed him turn meter. You better take this guy out. He is not abundantly squishy. You can get him right around the 70k health and shield combination. He can one-shot people. He is just insane. I love him. He could be my favorite character in the game. He is just amazing. He nukes people to the ground. He can be put in any team, any comp, bleed comp. You need a damage dealer. The only thing that brings him down a little bit for me is he has no AoE. But he doesn't need it. You want to take somebody out? Two balls, your guy. Awesome. He's just good. So there's my case. Yell at me all you want, but it won't change my opinion that he is a top 10 character in this game. When built right, get him to... I mean, right now, I use him constantly, and I have him at 4 star. I use him in tournaments when I can. Yes, he's a little squishier. I get it. But he's viable at 4 star. Gear 11 4 star, you can use this guy in battlegrounds, tournaments. I love him. Just love him. Love to bald number eight. Number seven, Eric Shieldbreaker. Still a meta character for one move and one move only, and we'll get to that. Passive ability, physical damage by 30%. An additional 5% for each living human in the party. Love it. Okay. It's got, he's still benefiting from something. You know, tier seven on this ability. We just up it and we up it. Fine. Rousing Cry. Debuff immunity and an armor increase. Both of them to four allies for two turns. This needs to be the whole party on a tier seven. Easy. Done. He would be higher if his Rousing Cry had a T7 on it. He could be top five. Because then you don't have to, you could pair him with anybody who summons minions. You put him with somebody who summons a minions and it can screw up your whole dynamic of your team. That's what drops him down just a scotch for me. Then you have the Colossic Strike. 390. This attack deals 30% more against shields. Gains a damage increase for two turns. Perfect. What I would like to see here on a tier 7. More damage. More against shields. And maybe a critical chance increase as well. That would be big. Here. 180 physical damage plus an extra 80 physical damage that penetrates shields. This needs to go up, and I'd like to see him like inflict like an armor decrease. That could really benefit the team as a whole. That would be really good. But Eric Shieldbreaker for his Rousing Cry is simple. He can crank damage. He's no two bald, but that Rousing Cry makes him one of the most coveted characters in the game at endgame because it can screw everything up with the lack of dispellers. 
it just makes it a B to get around. And Eric the Shieldbreaker, rightfully deserve it in the top 10. And I think that number seven for him is a good spot. Number six is Wu Kong, newest addition to the Pride. And you might be saying, Zary, Wu Kong at six? I don't know about that. Well, let's put it this way. I have him five star gear 11. No gear 11 pieces. One T7 ability. I use him all the time. He makes the pride that much better. You pair a gear 12 Wukong with tier 7 abilities and a gear 12 Salvador. <sighs> yeah, good luck. But let's take a look at his move kit. If he has at least one duplicate alive, this is a tier 7 ability. He survives fatal damage. Any effect active is removed. Random duplicate dies instead. Right? Um... And he receives that duplicate's health, gains invisibility for two turns. You pair that with a Renara or a Roxy, you're back to full health in no time. At the start of the turn, copies all different buffs except Taunt from his duplicates. So he, his next turn, he's going to get them all back. Everything he lost when he died, he gets back. Insane. At the start of his turn, he removes all debuffs from himself and applies them to his duplicates. Such a good move kit. Here. Monkey Business, which I believe is his most important T7. Summons one duplicate with 50% of Wukong's health, 60% of his damage. Duplicate gains 20% turn meter and counterattack. If there's at least three pride, we can't take that into consideration, but you get an extra one. Gets taught for one turn, and then it just continues to go up. So pairing him with pride is the obvious choice, but you don't need pride. Here, tier 7. 300 physical damage to all enemies and inflicts a damage decrease for three turns. Restores 20 to 40% turn meter to all of his duplicates. Massive. Deals 275 physical damage. If the target is inflicted by days. Otherwise, the cooldown of a random ability by one. Otherwise, inflicts days by one turn. And his duplicates can put on the days. You're spreading mass days because those duplicates are going to have taunt. Now, I did his noob series, and he's the tail of two monkeys. I still use him everywhere because I still feel he's better than the lower end pride, right? But putting T7s on this guy, which I have to take into consideration, putting him at gear 12, which I have to take him into consideration, makes him a completely different champion. And he makes him a top 10 champion. Wukong 6, well-deserved, monster of a character, he could be pushing top five, but I just can't push him there yet because you do need pride to take him to a top five character. If I was including synergies into this, he would be a top five character, but he's not because the pride knock him just out of the top five. Number five is Hard Orc. And if you play Hard Orc at gear 11, tier six, he's okay. Maybe top 30. You put tier 7s and take him to gear 12, Hard Orc is top 5. He is amazing. His T7s to me are the best in the game. Salvador is 2. Removes 1 debuff from each ally at the start of his turn. That's summon minions. You make him as fast as you can possibly make him. He is the best support character in the game, in my opinion. Because of his tier 7s. Here, tier 7 gains cheat death, regeneration, damage increase to all allies. And then gives himself 80% turn meter. Now this is T8, I get it, but I gotta take that into consideration. All allies. 80% turn meter. Here, he gives it to 4 allies. And then restores 40% of his turn meter. Tier 7 is still amazing. Power solo. Tier 7. 250 physical damage. AoE, whatever, you don't care about damage. 80% chance for ability block. Monster. Monster. Basic at tier 7, 280, bleeding for 3 turns. Hard Orc at gear 12, tier 7s, and with the tier 8, he's one of the best characters in the game. He changes the Orcs, he changes any team you put him on because of that dispel by doing nothing. Ability block and then cheat death regeneration and a damage increase to everybody He's phenomenal. These T7s change this character and this is what T7 should be T7 should be game-changing 
and they should change the character for the better. And this is an example of what good T7s can do to a character. Him and Salvador. Hard Orc. Top 5. Easy. Number 5. Hard Orc. Number 4. Buff. Buff is here because he's buff. He's been nerfed four times and he's still a top four character. Can't, can't take into effect his, his lead, but he can be plug and played with anyone in this game. Anyone. Dodge increase for each living demon in the party. Okay, you lose his passive. Whatever. Still doesn't matter. Turn meter swap. Dispel on both him and the ally. Both getting potency increase for turn turns and recover health. Passive healing. Two debuffs remove. Turn meter swap. Game changing. Dice throw. I, I'm not going to read this because we all know what it does. But you're applying eight buffs to random people and eight debuffs to random enemies. Insane. Blinds in there. Ability block. Debuff immunity. Or buff immunity, sorry. It's insane what he can do. 250 physical damage, 30% chance to decrease the target's turn meter by 30%. On a basic, you can take away 30% turn meter. It's just a bonus. This guy is so good. But, to benefit from his passive, you need demons. Looking at the other three characters that are above him, you don't need anybody else. And that's why he's out of the top three. Because to maximize his move kit for me, you still need demons with him somewhere. To get the full benefit. You don't need him, but you need him, if that makes sense. And the three characters above him don't need anything to make them better. Nothing. And that's why he's four. Number three, more doom. Now you could move around the top three and I could make arguments against them, but I really couldn't make a strong enough one not to justify why they're where you want to put them. So let's get that out of the way. More doom at three. Unbelievable. And the reason he's at number three is because of the mini nerf he took. That hurt him. He summons his own imps, but he also has the caveat for each living demon. Doesn't need it though because he summons his own imps, okay? But you gotta be careful who you pair with more doom. If you put an Eric Shieldbreaker with more doom, you might not get that debuff immunity. Your minion might. So that's why he's three for me. It's just that simple little caveat of that it could really screw up who you pair with him. But Rock's Curse, unfreaking believable. Massive damage, armor decrease, tenacity decrease, slow. Damage decrease, potency decrease, ability block, three turns at tier six. Insane. Just insane. Here, two imps. <clears throat> T7 for him is I'd like it to be three imps. That'd be big. You don't have to touch anything else. Leave him at 50% health, leave him at 50% shield, 80% damage, just give us three imps. That would increase. Here, he would get 30 more tenacity and 30 potency. Plenty. Here, 290 on a basic removes two debuffs. Or two buffs, I'm sorry. Tier 7, make it three buffs. And that's it. Maybe up the damage to 340. He just spells on his basic. If there was somebody who applied like a counter attack, he'd be massive. More Doom, like I said, the only reason I didn't put him in the top two is because of his minions hurt your team comp sometimes. And that's it. His kit is so good. So good. More Dooms at three. Number two, Garrett. Garrett breaks the game. To me, he breaks the game. And he doesn't have tier sevens. I should finish him off here. Let's, let's finish him off and I'll try to get his... He could be my first gear 12 champion. Right? And... He's just so good. You can put him with anyone. Anyone. Everyone is running this guy in some way, shape, or form. Raids. Tournaments. Battlegrounds. If, as a newer player, he is the first character I would go after. Because you're going to get Solius. And under a Solius lead, he gets the counter chance. 
He's just so good. Right? Garrett draws a random ability. He fits in any team. You want him in a burn team. You have the chance. You want him in a bleed team. A poison team. He has the only mass dispel in the whole game. With his mage arrow. Anti-mage arrow. That can't be overstated. You can't undervalue the mass dispel. Yes, it's RNG based. I get it. But you can get that. I went up against the team in Battlegrounds. He got it three times in a row. Three. Here. Removes invisibility from all enemies. Blinds them for one turn. All allies gain an accuracy increase. Right? You don't need Eric Shieldbreaker to make this guy good. Now. They what they need to do, and this needs to be fixed with Major Shot and him, is if he's blind, he should not be able to inflict the blind. I don't like that mechanic, and I'll be the first to say if they changed it, I'm okay with it. And you should be too, because frankly, it's crap to me. But would he still be number two? He'd be in the top three, four, five, somewhere in there. But to me, I hate that mechanic. I think it's dumb. If you, you can get off the blind first... You should not be able to inflict blind. That being said, 300 physical damage to all enemies, and he uses the bolt. Mass dispel. The mass only mass dispel in the whole game. Amazing. Basic. 300 and applies the bolt used. The cool thing is, if he gets counter, like you pair him with a buff and he gets a counter attack chance... If he has that mass dispel and they keep going after him, he doesn't lose it on a counter. It's so cool. So, could you imagine this guy with tier 7s? Let's take a look. Here. This is going to be really hard to do, but all debuffs should last for two turns. That is the only change I would I would make to this, is debuffs last for two. Right? I don't want to add another arrow because then it decreases that chance of the anti-mage bolt. All right, but if they were going to add another one, what I'd like to see is an armor decrease. Okay, I think that would be cool, but I don't want that to happen. All I want to happen here in a tier seven is they last for two turns. Maybe give them, give Eric and Garrett, you know, increases their health by 20% and their speed by 15. There you go. Increase duration of debuffs by two or by one to make it two. Give them a little bit more. Here. This one, if they put on a T7, okay, inflicts blind. If they move that to two turns, I think that would be a little bit too OP. I really do. So the accuracy increase maybe goes up to three. This goes to three. And here, I would like to see Garrett and Eric get debuff immunity. Then they'd incorporate the Eric synergy. Really cool. Here. I would like to see this damage up to like 400, 450. Okay? That's it. Because he's applying that bolt. So just give him more damage. Here, more damage, but I'd like to see something else brought in. Maybe if it's a crit, he increases his turn meter by 15 or 20%. I'd like to see that brought into it. And that's really all I could think of for tier 7s for this guy. He breaks the game. He is so good. Eric, Shieldbreaker... And Garrett put together are just an amazing combo. But you don't need that. Put him with anybody you want. Garrett, number two. And number one has to be Thalane. Now, I want Thalane to be my first gear 12, but I was so much closer to Garrett. But you can put Thalane as the lead. Just to benefit herself. Me and Bones talked about this. Taking away her leadership really doesn't hurt the elves that much. You use her leadership to benefit her. That's why in, in tournaments, people just run her as a lead when they can just to benefit her. She is the best character in the game. Now, you could make a case for more Doom. You can make a case for Garrett. I get it. But it's really hard not to agree with me here that Thalane is the best character in the game. She's broken. She actually hurts the game, in my opinion. Because it makes it boring. Because everybody uses Thalane. Now... I've seen some top-end people. Um, Ram is a good example. He doesn't use Selene in his arena team, and he smokes. You don't have to use her. But if you have her, and you're not at the very end of endgame, you're using her everywhere. Everywhere. Passive ability. 
Debuffing an enemy increases turn meter by 20%. An additional 4% for each debuff the lane applied. Don't need anybody else. Need nothing. Here, 270 to all enemies. If all enemies receive damage, inflict heal block or ability block for one turn. Here, 440. Heal block and buff immunity. The only debuff she's missing is blind. She puts on all the de best debuffs in the game. Days on a basic. How could this, she get better? Again, we don't want to break the game even more with her. So, if you're putting on a T7 here, right? Debuffing an enemy increases turn meter. I would only take this to 25%. Or maybe take this to 10% for each one. That's it. And I don't even know if I take it to 10%. Here. 270. All enemies. Obviously, you increase the damage. Enemy receiving damage. Right here, I would say if four enemies, then it puts on ability block for one turn. Because you still have that potency tenacity check. Here, increase the damage, inflicts heal block and buff immunity for two turns. I would put in a caveat here, if it increases, if it was a critical hit or something like that, you get back maybe 5% turn meter or 10% turn meter. And that could still break her. I don't know. I'd have to test it. But here, we need to increase the damage. Daze an enemy for three turns here. And maybe puts on an armor decrease or a potency. Or what I'd love to see is increases the duration of heal block for one turn. That would be cool on a basic. But there's not much to do to her. She's already the best person in the game. And all of the things I just described could break her. And break the game. Even more. She's OP. And she was even more OP before the nerf. And I'm glad they nerfed her. People were upset about it. But it was ridiculous. Literally, if you got the first one to do her Blade Fury, she could just go again, go again, go again, go again. And the team's dead. It was broken. It needed to be nerfed. But with that being said, Thelane is my number one champion in the game. So my YouTube family, there it is. There is the whole series of worst to first, and I love doing this, so I hope you had fun with it too. Let me know what you think, you know? A lot of people have agreed with me what I said, and a lot of people like the suggestions I'm making for the T7s. And I know Lizard Breath and the crew watch these videos, but again, so, that's my list. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about the characters I put in the top 10. So with that being said, if you're just finding me for the first time, you like what you see, click that subscribe button, like the video, spread the XMG family. You can always unsubscribe if you don't like what I'm putting out later, right? To my XMG family members out there, I can't do this journey without you. I love you all so much, more than you ever know. So, there is the tier list, worst to first. Till next quarter, love you. I'm out.